conferences, and then I presented a slide. I'm just going to put the two conferences up again quickly just to get our mindset into what's gone on or is going on in this situation and how the next part of what's hopefully going to come later has been influenced by the strategic goals that were outlined in these conferences. The Cairo conference, as you see here, uh, is an issue related to how various resources are going to be allocated, what kinds of end game is going to be developed. Now, you'll notice in this that Korea was to be independent. Remember, Korea had been basically occupied the Japanese for decades prior to all of this. And in addition, that certain, I'll call them informal reparations in the form of industries in China that had been created by the Japanese were going to revert to China. And again, the issue of unconditional surrender. And I highlighted that a bit because of the status of the emperor. And I talked a little bit about that last time. The emperor descending from the divine had a very particular status in Japan and was a stumbling block for negotiations that some of you may have heard about as the end of the war approached. Could, the, could you go back and take a real close look at Roosevelt? Yes. Very healthy. And well, you can watch him age mm -hmm. as the conferences proceed. That's an excellent point. And you'll also notice that in these conferences, especially in the next, next picture, that Churchill doesn't look all that happy. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so when they finally get to Tehran and Stalin is able to join them, again, Roosevelt looks rather vigorous. The posturing that he demonstrates is quite different from that in Churchill. And one of the reasons for this, it was clear the Americans were now in ascendancy. Britain was beginning to diminish and its relative importance in the conduct of the war and the strategic goals that were being sought were going to change and rely more on American direction than they were on British direction. That's not to say the British didn't have enormous influence, they did, but it was also clear that the Americans were going to be in charge. And this had a great deal of effect. One of the other reasons for showing this is the description halfway down that says post-war Germany. What was that country going to look like? How was it going to be dealt with once the Nazi regime had been destroyed? And in that particular situation, the political goals outlined by the different people who were sitting in these chairs had a great deal to do with the military conduct. What goals do we want to achieve? The old idea that possession is nine-tenths of the law has an enormous influence here. And Stalin was certainly acutely aware of that and had a great deal of distrust of Churchill in particular, a little bit less so of Roosevelt, and what was going to be accomplished with the destruction of Germany. So we keep this uh, in mind as we move into late 1944 and then in particular 1945. Remember also now Stalin is aware that Roosevelt has mentioned, not mentioned, described unconditional surrender. And he's absolutely on board with that because it gives him political power that accompanies his military power and the gains that are being taken. So this allows him, remember, as a supreme dictator, someone who has no compunction of getting rid of millions of people whom he sees as opponents and of oppressing those who remain in order to achieve his own particular political goals. Roosevelt on the other side is almost implied in this photograph is looking off into the distance. Mm -hmm. What is he seeing? He's seeing a form of global utopia. And that ain't gonna happen, okay? But his mindset, and if you look at what he wanted to accomplish, 
makes perfect sense from a liberal society, and I use that with a small L, all right? No political commentary implied with this, but a liberal Western approach to things and how governments are to work, what governments functions truly are in representing the will of the people. And this is very distinctly different from Stalin, where the will of the people is only understood as a function of the goals of the state. We have to keep this in mind because I remember, Tom, you were kind enough to send out that we posted to all of you some questions, which we're going to address and open up for discussion in a little bit, but I wanna get into the beginning of this. But this sets the groundwork for the practical execution of military conflict and where that is to lead us down the road. Now, the strategic bombing campaign has a number of different elements to it. This is just a very easy description of some of the things that started out and laid the framework for what strategic bombing was about. And then the question comes up is why do strategic bombing or even more basic, what is strategic bombing? What does that really mean? Well, compared to tactical or operational bombing, strategic bombing does not specifically target military units per se. Its intent is to strike deep behind the front lines and particularly target certain elements that are thought to be useful in the war's movement or the support that can be generated by the host nation for its own armies. Now, the question of legality. Interestingly, up until World War II, even though some strategic bombing had taken place in World War I, as Robert had mentioned, with the Zeppelins and World War I going over and trying to attack London, which was more a nuisance raid or at best a terror raid because it wasn't going to have any effect on the industry. Was that going to be something dealt with through the laws of war? And the answer is it was ignored. Now, the question of why it was ignored has a lot to do with what happened in the interwar years, and I'll come to that in a little bit, that began to define the power that was anticipated to be present in air forces and what were appropriate targets for air forces. Now, interestingly, Russia, Italy, and Germany took a very different approach from the United States and Great Britain. And we'll come to that in a bit as we see the next set of transitions. Then the next question, which was not something the laws of war define, but are incorporated. In other words, why do you create a law at all? Is there an ethical basis for it? In the sense that, is it fair? Is it ethical to target civilians specifically, even if their job is to create weapons of war? Is that an ethical function? Because they are unarmed. Are you allowed under the laws of war as currently structured prior to World War II, is the military allowed to go in and shoot all the civilians? The answer is no, that was considered a war crime. But you could bomb them. That's a little different, right? No, it's not. You're killing civilians. <laughs> so the issue of the ethical nature really only becomes apparent after the war, and you'll see from the way this concludes, what happens to the civilian populations. Yes. Essentially, you can bomb them if they're in the factory, but if they're in at home, you can't. And that implies a certain degree of accuracy, which yes. is the next part. What kind of targets? And is it effective? And how is you determine effectiveness? Accuracy. What's the point of dropping a bomb to try to destroy this building if we're manufacturing something, if the bomb is going to land in the residential area a mile off? 
how accurate is it? Now, we hear today increasingly about precision weapons, right? But we also have to deal with the concepts that I'm pointing out here that are in play right now, right to this day, in Ukraine and in the Israel, Gaza, and now Iran actions. Because as you're all aware, what happened just this past week with Iran and its surrogates sending over drones and cruise missiles and even ballistic missiles to attack Israel. Now, unfortunately, if you read certain things, one description I ran across was the Iranians were targeting military targets, which is a bunch of crap, frankly. All right, it just ain't so. <laughs> and when you look at it from the standpoint of that, it is strategic bombing. It's just that they didn't use aircraft to fly over and drop dumb bombs. They launched everything from the homeland or from their surrogates in Yemen and Syria and so on. So strategic bombing still occurs. What about Ukraine? Russia's been sending missiles over into Ukraine hitting cities, allegedly seeking out military targets. But if you look at the destruction that occurs, you'll realize that precision weapons ain't so precise all the time, okay? I, so, yes. I disagree. They were very precise because they hit what they aimed at. Well, for the most part, but if you look at some of the damage done elsewhere, there's plenty of collateral damage and civilians who were killed. By they comparison, were in schools and hospitals. Oh, well, <laughs> so, they were. No, you're talking about Gaza. I'm talking about Ukraine. Oh, okay. I I have to say that in part, when you say you hit what you're aiming at, that brings us to the question of why are you aiming? And that's what we're looking at in the final iteration here. Is it effective politically? What is the goal of strategic bombing ultimately? We have to keep that in mind. How does it influence the domestic political scene and support for the war? How does it affect international relations? Not just how it affects your enemy, but international relations. And all we have to do is read practically any newspaper nowadays and or any media site, and you will have this discussion crop up, and you'll have to address it in our own minds as to how we support or don't support what our country is doing, just as an example. So I keep these things in mind. Now, why is this guy important? Like many of the leaders in the military who were developing techniques for the conduct of the coming war during the interwar years, certain principles resonated more with some than with other and they had a greater or lesser influence on the military developments that were going to occur. So Julio Duhay, seen here, figured out that air power would be probably in his mind, the most critical manner of conducting the next war. And through this idea that there were five legitimate targets involving what you see listed here, but notice the last part. You want to influence the will of the population of your enemy. You want to break his morale because ultimately wars are won by surrender of your opponent. That means your opponent no longer wishes to continue the fighting. If you don't break that morale, the war will continue ad infinitum. We've had that experience in Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam as just easy examples where you could not break the morale of your opponents. You could kill a lot of them, but that didn't mean they gave up. In this regard, Stan Wee Baldwin from England, even as early as 1932, postulated the bomber will always get through. What this meant was that cities we're going to be the prime targets. We'll come back to the accuracy issue in a little bit. 
because I'm going to open up in a while to the discussions that based on the questions I postulated below. Now, you'll notice that in his particular description, he also mentions the use of poison gas. Well, Saddam Hussein used poison gas against the uh, one of the populations in northern Iraq when he was still in power. So this is something that was designed to suppress, intimidate, and terrorize a population. Poison gas was not used during World War II because the repercussions were considered too severe. Greg? And the Syrians used poison gas in steroids. Yes, right. If so, these things have not gone away. You can prohibit whatever you want. But the question ultimately is going to come down to what means do you have available to yourself which you can use to accomplish your political aims? And then the targets become a surrogate for those goals. And if it means targeting civilians, then so be it. The important part here is the following. At the time of the crisis over the Sudetenland, right, the so-called appeasement of Munich by Chamberlain, most people who look at Chamberlain at that time forget a couple of essential points. And that is the following. He was told by his air ministry, at that point, they could not protect British cities from strategic bombing. Hitler had built up an air force of considerable power by that time, but he was even more a master of propaganda. And so he put on very deliberate shows with lots of bombers flying around, but he would use the same bombers over and over and over again to impress his opponents with what was thought to be their strategic strike ability. And Chamberlain is told, we don't have enough aircraft to defend England. We're going to get pummeled. And if Douay's principles were valid, which people thought was the case, why then you just have to find a way to deflect Hitler you don't want strategic bombing against your cities. You have to build up an appropriate defense. Now, if you want another example of how the concept of strategic bombing gains hold, you look at American policies after World War II with the reliance on nuclear power and the diminution of land power, and even to the point where the jets aren't carrying guns they're carrying missiles. And then we find out to our dismay that you need guns on fighters because of the nature of the, the conflict. So we had gotten to a particular position in our own philosophy, which emphasized the dangers of strategic bombing. And of course, that's what nuclear weapons are all about, right? You don't care if it's going to hit the Empire State Building or if it's going to hit the Met. All you want to do is get it somewhere close, right? Now, there are different targets that are involved, and I'm going to hit this only quickly so that we can come back to the issues a little bit later. But I mention this because there are a number of different missions that strategic bombers carry out, not simply just go bomb a city, and that's what's reflected here. But notice that not Paris, Rome, or Vienna were really struck much at all by strategic bombing. And there are reasons for that, which had a great deal to do with the lack of particular industry, but more importantly, because of the cultural effects that existed. So they had less relevance, and there would have been great blowback if the Allies in particular had struck any of those cities. Remember that Paris was declared an open city in May of 1940 when the Germans came in for the very reason they didn't want the city blasted. And you may know, some of you, that when eventually the Germans were retreating from France, there is a book called Is Paris Burning, where he was told, the general in charge was told to, to basically level the city, and he refused. 
okay? So these are the kind of issues, but we bombed Berlin, London was bombed, Tokyo was devastated, okay? So the major capitals were not necessarily free of retribution. What is the problem with strategic bombing? In World War II, accuracy. The Norden bomb site was touted as, I can put a bomb in a pickle barrel at 10,000 feet. There is a concept called circular error of probability. And what that is, is you draw a circle and half of your bombs will land within it. Now, it was touted that at 10,000 feet in testing, the Norden could have a circular area of probability of about 300 feet. So that meant if you're targeting this building, it could land over there. 50% would land within a 300 foot perimeter. I mean, sorry, radius. Diameter, not radius, diameter. So 150 feet that way, 150 feet that way, you're dropping a 500 pound bomb. Frankly, I don't wanna be sitting in this building. <laughs> What was not recognized, of course, was that testing isn't reality. It's not combat. The other part of the Norden bomb site, which gave it the accuracy it was supposed to have, is the bomb site actually took control of the airplane. The pilot had hands off, and the bombardier using the Norden bomb site ran the aircraft and he had to run it straight and level for a period of time before the bombs dropped. And only after the bombs left the aircraft was the return of authority back to the pilot. What did that mean? If you're a flat gunner, and we'll come to that in just a little bit, and you see those aircraft coming over, suddenly they're on a straight flight path no deviation. That makes them easier targets than if they're fluctuating up and down or they're going from side to side or whatever, trying to evade the targeting. Logistics for heavy bombers was very intense, as you can imagine. And it required specialists not just to run the aircraft, but to maintain them. Poor self-defense. Well, we'll come to that in a minute, but basically the aircraft could take modest amounts of damage at different times. Though I'll show you a photograph in a minute that exemplifies just how tough these aircraft were. And because of the large crews, if an aircraft went down, you might lose all 10 in a fortress, 11 in a, a liberator or 11 or 12 in a Lancaster or a Sterling. So you had losses that were considerable when your aircraft went down. And those are the ones that either finally bailed out, but now they're bailing out over enemy territory. Mm -hmm. If you recall way back when the Germans were attacking England, when their planes were shot down, where did their pilots end up? Either in the channel or in England. <laughs> so they became Prisoners of war, you never, you didn't see them again. And that was true of the Japanese. You didn't recover these people. Now, just as the timeline, actually strategic bombing occurred even as early as 1939, though it was very, very modest. But once things started to gear up in 1940 with the collapse of France and being able to move uh, air units from Germany into France proper, you now had a shorter distance over which you needed to fly, which meant you could put fighter cover up and protect your bombers. But the Germans never focused on developing a true strategic bomber. For nearly all of the actions that took place against England, they used twin engine bombers and even Stukas, which were inappropriate and they learned that lesson painfully very quickly because they were slow and very vulnerable to uh, fighter act activity and they had to withdraw them. They were designed for tactical activities. But the British had been developing true strategic heavy bombers. And over the course of the years, 
increasing numbers of British bombers, and we'll see a little bit of an example in a minute, began to bomb not just France, but even the coastal areas of Germany, and then even penetrated into Germany itself, which forced a reorganization of German fighters from the Eastern Front, particularly back to the homeland to defend it. So one of the unexpected, perhaps unexpected, advantages of strategic bombing was to weaken the support that aircraft provided in the Eastern Front and pull them back into Germany. Now, what about attitudes? This is a particularly useful Michael, statement. Michael, can I ask a question? Of about course. How did Wernicke color the thinking about strategic bombing? It had some influence, but, uh, and I pronounced it Guernica, so I'm not okay. correcting you, it's because my Spanish is off. Yeah, well, <laughs> mine is worse. <laughs> yes. Guernica turned out to be one of those propaganda issues that actually played a significant role from the German standpoint, because they used what was called the Condor Legion <laughs> to do some of this strategic bombing during the Spanish Civil War. It turned out that the targets that were being hit in Guernica were actually military targets and some bridges that were close to the center of town. So it appeared that they were terror bombing the city when actually they were trying to intercept mm -hmm. some Spanish units that were retreating through the town to cross a river which was nearby. The casualty rates were inflated enormously, in a sense, by both sides, by the Spanish um, revolutionaries they were saying, look at what they did. They killed all these people. This was horrible and it was uncalled for. And this is how demonic these people are. And from the German side, they're saying, you can't protect a city. Look what happens. In actual studies posted many years after, the number of casualties was much, much less. So it's an interesting element of how propaganda played a role and convinced everybody from the highest levels down about how dangerous strategic bombing would be. So in the analysis of is it tactical bombing or is it strategic bombing in that Yes, case? tactical generally talks about how do you help your frontline troops? Then there's what's called operational, which is behind the front lines, but used primarily to interdict movement and to strike areas of communication or supply dumps or things of that sort. Then strategic takes you back primarily to the homeland. So this would be operational. In yes. Guernica. Right. Yeah. Guernica was a combination of sort of tactical, but operational more, because the frontline troops from the Spanish nationalists were not engaged at that point. They were chasing them, but there was enough separation of distance that they weren't able to actually uh, conduct fighting against them. For example, in the Eastern Front, the Stukas were used as sort of somewhat longer range artillery with a little more precision. So as the frontline German units advanced, the Stukas would fly over and determine where their armor concentrations or artillery concentrations that could threaten the frontline troops, and they would hit those. But they weren't going further back to hit communication centers necessarily or supply dumps. That was left to the medium bombers. Okay. Notice what Roosevelt says. And notice how this gets to be described in 1939 and that Germany agreed. Now, they bombed Warsaw, they bombed other Polish cities, and uh, they also bombed Rotterdam. But in each situation, the German high authority said these were fortified cities, our troops were in contact or close in contact, and the cities were not surrendering. So they became legitimate targets for us to take them. On the other hand, the propaganda 
again emphasize that when cities are bombed, the destruction is enormous. So this, trains, this changes the mindset of everyone that's involved. In 1940, this is just an example of the bombing of Rotterdam, okay? Now the RAF, the Royal Air Force says, well, how do we respond to what we've seen happen to Rotterdam? Well, this isn't our city, but we are engaged now in an open conflict with Germany and what are we going to do? And notice what they target, oil plants and civilian industrial targets, such as, and I put blast furnaces in because those were lit up even at night. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of find them if the weather was conducive. Notice that the REF raid takes place May 15th, 16th, 1940, May. So it's an interesting element as to who does what. Hitler prohibited indiscriminate attacks against British cities. Now notice the date, August 24, German bombers returning from England, not having found their primary target, don't want to try to come back laden with bombs. So they ended up dropping them, but they were off course. And as a result, they hit London. Now, it was thought that these guys would be prosecuted by Hitler, but within a short period of time, Britain said, listen, you hit us, we hit you. So tit for tat, and as a response, Hitler now directs bombing against British cities and Goering, who had said no British aircraft would ever strike Germany is in the doghouse par excellence. So he has to find a way to regain his own personal reputation. So as you get to September and November of 1940, you have what we traditionally refer to as the Blitz. Up until the Blitz begins, most of the German bombing of England was targeting airfields, and trying to suppress fighter opposition so they could get through to their targets with less loss. But when the bombing shifts to the cities, now those airfields are no longer under direct threat. And there's some historians who feel that that particular shift was what saved Britain. Now, we know about never in the what is it, human history has so much been owed by so many to so few. But the point is that the Germans played a role in that by shifting their strategic targets. And they didn't understand quite thoroughly the value of the radar systems that had been set up to detect oncoming aircraft and allow those aircraft to intercept the bombers. This is an example, and I show this because these numbers are gonna come up later. The tons of dr bombs dropped on England in 1940 to 45, 74,000 tons. Think of that as three and a half Hiroshima's, right, which were roughly 20 kilotons. That's what happened. Notice the casualties, notice the number injured. So for each ton of bombs dropped, you've got a couple of injuries or deaths. During the Blitz, 30,000 tons. So once you got past the Blitz, the number of attacks against uh, English cities is diminished considerably. And some of those casualties are due to the so-called vengeance weapons, the V1 and V2 that were targeting England, particularly in late 44 and 45. This just gives you another example of it. And I mentioned this because of the following, that you know, the numbers are very disparate. Don't worry about that. 2 million houses damaged or destroyed, 60% in London. So even having geared up their air force and fighters in the interim from appeasement to the actual attacks on England, this is how much damage was done. And for the Germans, through the time frames I've listed here, their losses were not inconsiderable either. 
That's what London kind of looked like after some of the blitz, gives you an idea. And as we move into strategic bombing, one of the things that I wanted to bring out here was this. The British had their own bomb site, but it was not as accurate as the Norden, and therefore was better used at night. And the British emphasized more area bombing than accuracy. Now, fair accuracy at 300 yards, 900 feet, okay? Think of that as your diameter from 10,000 10, feet up. And you had to fly level for 10 seconds. The Americans, as I mentioned earlier, had a circular error probability that was much less, but notice in practice that went up by almost a factor of 10, okay? So in the real world, fine and dandy, <laughs> testing doesn't always work. The reason for showing this also is to give some ideas of the proportionality of fighters because in today's climate, these numbers are almost impossible to understand. I mean, it's inconceivable. But most particularly, what I want to show you is the ascendancy of the United States compared to Germany and to the United Kingdom. This has to do with the production uh, capabilities of the United States. Now, we were sending aircraft to the Pacific as well, but I want to just underscore here that even by December of 1943, when our strategic bombing in Europe is beginning to gear up, the number of aircraft available is well above that of German aircraft. Now this is of all types, right? But the point is that the heavy bomber component of this is substantial. We've all heard about this guy. Now, which airplane which heavy bomber carried the heaviest bomb load? Anyone? B-29. The B-29, which did not come into effect until late 44, and it was based initially in China, right? It wasn't until later that it ended up in the Western Pacific. Prior to that, which heavy bomber? B-24. And this is what's interesting, because I had the same reaction, okay? And if we look at this, what you'll see is that the bomb load of the B-17 was 6,000 pounds, three tons. Notice the armament was a heavy 50 caliber machine guns. Now, the reason I put the speeds in have to do with this. Your cruising speed gets you to your target. You're not flying at 300 miles an hour. So if you're flying at 170 in a fighter aircraft, comes up that's flying at nearly 300 miles an hour, you can begin to understand how difficult it would be to fend them off. He's coming at you very fast. So that's an issue. You increase your maximum speed perhaps when you're getting near the target, but you have to be cautious there. If you're going too fast, you might throw off your bomb. You wouldn't need to target it properly. So the Norden bomb site, all these bomb sites have to take into account how fast you're flying, at what altitude, that you're on level flight, and so on. So the maximum speed didn't play a whole big role. But the one thing about the Flying Fortress that is tough, this is an unbelievable picture where a ME-109 slice through the back end of a B-17 and nearly severed it, but that aircraft was still flying, dropped its bomb load and returned to England. How did it manage? They used parachute straps that they strung across the open parts to try to cinch it on because they found whenever they tried to maneuver the airplane, the tail would shudder. Mm -hmm. Now think if you're the gunner in the tail, would you get out of there? He tried to, but they found that when he left, his weight moving forward made the tail more unstable. He had to go back and stay in the tail. 
And when they finally landed in England, and this is one of those things that you just can't make up, the aircraft lands, gets to the end of the taxiway, and the tail falls off. <laughs> Uh, and the control cables. Everything's gone. Well, yeah, because they they go through the ceiling of the B-17, so they're all cut. Right. So the, yeah, no. How the guy could fly it is unbelievable. But this is an example. I just, I love this picture. I would not have wanted to be in that aircraft. <laughs> the B-24 Liberator actually had a greater bomb load. 8,000 pounds. It had 11 machine guns, and its maximum speed, as you see, is roughly that of the B-17, crew of 11. In this regard, though, what was interesting, it was felt that this heavy bomber did not sustain the kind of damage a B-17 could, that somehow it was more vulnerable. And therefore, much of its activity was surrogated initially down into North Africa and then into uh, the 15th Air Force, which was based in Italy and in the Pacific. So it had its biggest functions there. And the range that you look at, the range means how far out do you go before you have to turn around and come back? And it depends on your bomb load and the height at which you're flying and so on. Now, what about the defenses? We've all heard of the famous German 88. This is a uh, picture that I took at a museum that had one there. But the reason I'm showing this is the following. Look at the, the number of allied aircraft destroyed, 6,400, 27,000 damaged. And if you look down into the specs down below, you'll see that it could range up to 26,000 feet and that it's anti-ground activity, because that's where a lot of us have heard about the 88, is it could shoot out uh, 6,500 feet. And the rate of fire was high. Now, that's fine and dandy, but if you look at the projectile, you'll see that it would create 1,500 pieces of shrapnel. Now, you might say to yourself, well, so what? You know, the shrapnel's like a sphere blowing off in all directions, so how much is going to hit you isn't all that much of a big problem. But if you're flying straight and level, and you have this device, which can hit an aircraft, at used to help you hit an aircraft at 20,000 feet, and you're in for a world of hurt. And what this shows is that five people would run this with a, or I'm sorry, six with a commander, and they would watch the aircraft. They could feed in certain information on the angle at which it's flying and things of this sort and feed it to a battery of 88s or 127s or 155s, which had even better range and firepower, and they could target those aircraft. Notice the target height could be as high as almost 40,000 feet. So you were going to be seen if the weather was conducive. Now, the other part, I just show this because I think it's amusing. The target is traveling over a mile that it takes the time for the shell to arrive where you are. So the planning of all of this had to be integrated so you anticipate he's here now, he's going to be there by the time the shell arrives, that's our, that's our shooting point. The British, as I mentioned, had substantial interest in strategic bombing. The cruise speed of 200 miles per hour is faster than the Americans. Its range is certainly comparable. It's not armed anywhere near as heavily. A 30 caliber as this case, or 0.3 inch, is much less powerful than a 0.5, much less powerful. And it has only eight compared to the 10 or 12 that might be present on one of the American bombers. But notice it's bomb load. Much greater. 
than was present in American bombers until you get to the B-29, which had up to 20,000 pounds. And even the Sterling, again, showing you that it's faster than the Americans, good range, has still only 30 caliber, but it can carry 14,000 pounds. So this is a substantial aircraft that has a great deal of influence on what's going to happen. Now, what happens with the bombing? This gives you an idea of the dates involved and the tons dropped by allies. Now, what I want to emphasize here is to go back and have in your mind that throughout World War II, the number of tons dropped on England were about 75,000 tons. You look here, 1943, oh boy. <laughs> Look at 1944, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and even the five months of 1945, the numbers are staggering comparatively. Now that'll bring us back to some fundamental questions. Effectiveness, you remember on the slide that I showed at the beginning, how effective was it? Well, there are different ways to compute that. What did we do in Vietnam to decide if we had an effective battle or not? What did we call it? Body, Body count. count. Body count, right. And that indeed was a good part of what people looked at to try to figure out if the bombing was working. Now they couldn't go down and measure the casualties on the ground, right? They would look for, newspaper reports or casualty lists published by the host country, if you want, want to call them a host. <laughs> uh, or you'd look at your own losses and try to tally them up and try to figure out how many people were injured given this particular set of statistics because it boiled down to statistics, mm -hmm. okay? So when you look at this number, you look at Birmingham, Liverpool, and so on. And I showed you on an earlier slide, the total number of casualties in Britain, somewhere around 40,000 dead, whatever. We're looking at just a, one or two cities here as an example. And the first so-called thousand plane raid, which killed 20,000. In that regard though, the thousand plane raid is a bit of a misnomer. 20 or 1,000 took off, but only about 700 reached the target. The rest were diverted, had mechanical issues, and that's to say nothing of the duds that were dropped uh, and landed but didn't explode. But look at Berlin, Hamburg, Dresden, look at Tokyo. Firebombing deliberate attacks using incendiaries. We'll come to that a little bit later in the lecture. Look at the comparison with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So by comparison, you can see that destructive as a nuclear weapon was, and admittedly it's one bomb, whatever that really means, of considerable destructive power concentrated as only one bomb can concentrate it as opposed to area bombing with a lot of smaller bombs spread out over a greater distance. But indeed, a lot of these deaths were not due to the bomb itself. It was due to the firestorms that occurred, particularly in Dresden and in Tokyo, where you literally created such a fire that you sucked all the oxygen out of the area. Almost hurricane-like winds that came in to feed the fire. And people literally died for lack of oxygen. So you could have been protected from both the fire and the bomb, but you had no air. The effects on Dresden, as we see here, was probably one of the worst episodes of strategic bombing that was completely unnecessary at this point. But we had so many aircraft in England at this time and in Italy, and there were few remaining targets in Germany that hadn't been pummeled. Well, 
Dresden hasn't been hit. Let's go, let's go there. We can't let our aircraft sit down and do nothing. So they bombed the city, which actually had no significant military value. Even the city of Nuremberg, I mean, look at this. It's just awful in terms of what strategic bombing could do. Now you go back to the principle that Douay talked about in the interwar years, and you look at this picture, and I can't have help but ask myself, how would I respond to this? Would this increase my morale, my desire to fight, or would it weaken? This would be very difficult. Yes. I've read that when we bombed German cities like this and had this result, what that did was that shut down uh, most of the businesses that were operating in that area. And the German populace, if they wanted to be employed, they made munitions. They went out to the suburbs, they made munitions and munitions production, if they could get the materials, would go up. Have you ever read that or seen that? Uh, only indirectly, never as succinctly as you just phrased it. And when you think about the destruction, this is piling into roadways and everything else. How do you have access to food, water, energy, anything? I mean, this is much beyond just dead and injured. If you survive, how do you get to the next level? And you've just highlighted part of it. You get out of Dodge, but you got to find work and you have to find the necessities for life. And that's that's a very key point. Uh, yes. Wasn't there another dimension of eliciting a fighter response to attack the Luftwaffe so that the strategic bombers become essentially uh, an attractant so that the Luftwaffe have to respond and that will make the invasion easier because the Luftwaffe has been destroyed and you have air su supremacy. Yes, that's an excellent point as well. So there are a number of layers to the goals you're trying to accomplish. If the bombers get through, you destroy factories, industries that are supporting munitions, you disrupt communications. If you're lucky, you might take out the most critical factories, such as at Schweinfurt with the ball bearings or Ploesti with the oil and things of that sort. But you know you're going to attract opposition. That's why the Fortress and the Liberator were so heavily armed. And their particular tactic was to layer their aircraft in such a way that there were overlapping fields of fire so that no matter which direction was the attack from a fighter approaching your craft, you had not just your own aircraft, you had other aircraft shooting at this same plane. And the idea was to destroy them. Earlier in the year, actually up until 1944, however, we didn't have fighter aircraft that could follow the bombers all the way to their targets and back. And as a result, once the fighters turned around and the Germans were acutely aware of the range that was capable for the accompanying fighters, as soon as the fighters turned around and headed home, the Luftwaffe came up with their fighters and started to engage the bombers. So the bombers didn't just get attacked over the cities. In fact, the flak was responsible for defending the cities. The aircraft, the Luftwaffe, would engage them through the entire range going in. They'd land once the bombers were past their range of action. They would rearm, refuel, and they'd wait for them to come back because there were losses occurring which disrupted this tactical arrangement of aircraft as well. So once you shot down one or two aircraft, you had gaps in the defense of fire. But it was designed in good measure also to punish the Luftwaffe and take them out. Indeed, by the time of the Normandy landings, if you've seen the movie, The Longest Day, mm -hmm. as an example, there are two German fighters it's almost laughing about what they're going to have to go through to get there. So yes, you've hit that point. Yes. Go back to the bombing of the cities. But uh, my memory is extremely hazy. But it seems to me that before Dresden, um, the, Ger the Germans had sent the bombers over to Britain, as always. And they hit, I can't remember whether it was Coventry or Lancaster, and destroyed the cathedral. Mm -hmm. And they were madder than hornets. Right. And I still write down here my gift. 
takes about Dresden that says serve them damn right. <laughs> and you've hit an excellent point. I did not put Coventry up because there's an interesting issue that has resonated around the bombing of Coventry. And that was that one set of historians have said Churchill knew Coventry was going to be hit, but deliberately did not put up the kind of fighter power to deflect it because he was afraid it would reveal that we knew they were coming and where they were going. So Coventry was, in a sense, a sacrifice of sorts. But you've hit on the other critical part. You've done this to me, and we're going to come back to proportionality in a moment. All right. This is the key point that you've talked about. You punch me, I'm going to hit you 10 times harder. I'll show you that this isn't going to work. Yes. I'd like to make a mathematical point in terms of uh, uh, the air battle of Britain, mm -hmm. that if the Luftwaffe lost one in 10 planes coming over, well, that's not much. You still have nine, right? After six sorties, mm -hmm. you're less than 50% of your initial force. And that's an excellent point because by then, uh, Hitler had not geared up the German economy to total war. He didn't do that until surprisingly late in the war where everything was committed to winning. And as a result, their productions, well, they managed to keep the Luftwaffe kind of whole, as you may have noticed from the previous slide of German aircraft through the war, it really drops off dramatically in 45 because the production capabilities are gone. But it's an example of what you've talked about. But even worse was the loss of pilots. Mm -hmm. So you can put an airplane out there, but if you don't have anybody skilled to fly it, then you're nothing more than another target. Look, the loss of pilots could have been a lot worse because of the fact that the German pilots that were shot down over France were held by the French. And the English asked for them to be transferred to England, but French, oh, no, 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 we cannot do this. But when the Germans come in, hey, y'all, you get them back. <laughs> you got those back, but not yeah. the ones over the Battle of Britain. This gives an example of just one day of attack at Schweinfurt considered a primary target, but deep within Germany, so no fighter escorts uh, could really make the whole thing. They could get further in than before. So the P-47 had greater range, but it wasn't up to the P-51, the Mustang, which had fuel tanks and could take it all the way to a target and all the way back. But the P-47s and the Spitfires with shorter range could still penetrate further into French and even uh, German territory. Notice, though, that the casualties and bombers that take place, very few Allied fighters are shot down. But 60 bombers go down. And out of the remaining, you see the number that are heavily damaged. Notice the relative lack of loss on the German side for the cost that was engaged. So in spite of all this defensive fire that the B-17s had, the number of aircraft actually lost was relatively small by comparison. But this is one mission on one day. There was a temporary drop in production of 30%, but it was temporary. It's surprising how quickly factories could be bought back online in producing. Sorry, wrong way. There was another attack, this time about the same. The liberators were diverted towards Norway to try to draw off German fighter strength. The Germans were not uh, fooled by that at all. So they again mustered a sufficient strength. They attacked them from the Channel Coast all the way to the target, as I talked about before. You'll notice how many were destroyed, how many damaged. And only three yeah. P-47s are down. Why? Because they had to turn back. And why engage a fighter? 
Hmm. You know, heck with that, they're not gonna hurt you. And notice the relative loss of the Messerschmitts and so on. Ploesti, again, a serious target, 177 B-24s this time. They had slightly greater range and they were coming up from Foggia, coming up from Italy. And what did they encounter? And the reason I put up this German-Romanian strength here and I put up the casualties and losses, again, is to show you how much suffering occurred among the bombers as they go through this and that the losses involved here by comparison are much, much less to the defenders. Seven fighters destroyed, 19 dead, 97 wounded, trivial by comparison, and they had very little effect on the oil production. Now, I show this picture of Berlin at the end because Berlin was destroyed not just from the air, it was destroyed by the fighting when the Red Army attacked it. But the point I'm trying to illustrate with this is you look at this level of destruction and ask yourself, how does any nation survive this? Now we think about the Twin Towers going down and this not to trivialize what happened on that tragic day. But this is after five years of war and it is an amazing set of losses. And I have a picture of Tokyo <laughs> at the end as well, but I'm going to come to that a little bit. This is what the losses were, but look at the German civilian casualties. Now, notice it says 300,000 killed by Germans, and that has to do with a whole lot of different issues that occurred during the war. But the point I'm trying to make here is you're talking about 4 million plus casualties, but they fought to the bitter end. Air Force casualties, <clears throat> again, substantial for both uh, the United States and for the UK. The numbers were not separated by service between Army and Navy in the Japanese services, and I didn't have good numbers for that. So just to finish this part, we'll take a little break, then we'll come back because the next section on submarine warfare goes much quicker than this. But I wanna take the time after the break to address those questions that I postulated earlier on and give the people in Zoom a real chance to join in with that discussion. I show this because when the Japanese were raiding in China, they again, had relatively few what we would call heavy bombers. They had very capable bombers, but they weren't quite of the number or structure. That is what their bomb loads were to be and what their purpose was to be. So more medium bombers were used. And during the uh, war itself, in terms of China, this is roughly what we're looking at. But notice that in terms of homes destroyed, and I, these numbers are, can be questioned, or even at the number of deaths that you're looking at, think about what happened in one city. When I showed you the effect on Tokyo, you know, up to 200,000 an example of what was going on. This gives the relative strengths. Again, the idea behind this shows that the total available aircraft, even as early as January 42 for the US, but now remember, we've got both the European theater and the Pacific theater. The total US numbers are always greater than they are for the Japanese. And the numbers become increasingly divergent as we get further into the war. Now the Marines alone, if you look at that number set of numbers, outnumber the number of the Japanese in its US Navy and Marines because the Marines had their own contingent of aircraft. But that shows you the production capabilities and the pilot availability and training that existed and why perhaps Yamamoto said, I can run rampant for six months, but after that, there are no guarantees. 
This gives you an idea of some of the strategic bombing, but notice the reason this slide is here, it's the following. The difference between high explosive and incendiary. I think it was Hap Arnold, if I remember correctly, who took over in the Pacific later on and instructed the American bombers to do two things which were considered to be almost suicidal. He stripped out most of the defensive weapons. Hey. All right, Lemay, right, not Hep Army. And not only did he strip out the weapons, he had them fly at 10,000 feet and load up with incendiaries. Why? Because most of the Japanese cities were constructed with wood. The amount of concrete and steel was proportionally much, much less. So the idea was you start all these fires and they're just going to spread throughout the city. And they did. They got so intense <laughs> that they were running out of incendiaries. Couldn't make them fast enough. Notice here it says the number of civilians killed and injured. I think these numbers can be a bit suspect. But it gives you a sense when we look at the number of Germans who were killed by strategic bombing, not just injured. We're talking 2 million dead for Germany on that slide I showed you, and about 2 million injured. And that is almost exclusively from the U.S. and British Air Forces. The Russians did very, very little what we would call strategic bombing. They were tied up to the tactical and operational. The super fortress, an extraordinary uh, weapon. As you see here, it even had a cannon in the tail. Initially, they had to take that out to save weight. But the point was that they had remote controlled turrets were also a problem with defensive capability. But notice that it was fast. It had great range. It could fly at a very high uh, altitude, but it was carrying 10 tons of bombs. That's what Tokyo looked like. Not much left. That's what Hiroshima looked like. No, sure. Not much left. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back now and ask you take a few minute break. You've been very patient to listen to this part. And I want to take at least 10 to 15 minutes to allow us to ask the questions or discuss those issues about the ethics, the efficacy, but most particularly the ethics of strategic bombing, of going directly after a civilian population, directly bombing areas, <clears throat> not bombing specific targets, which is where we've shifted to today, fortunately but still civilians are going to be targets. And how that resonates with what we think about is going on today, whatever side you choose, I don't care. That's not what this is about. It's about what options you have in front of you and how you're going to react when your opponent does something similar or <laughs> initiates it. So let's take a break. And if anyone in Zoom land wants to ask a question while we take a break, that's fine too. <clears throat> Tom, did anyone raise a hand? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. This is something I want to. Yes. Circular error probability, but it's the diameter, isn't it? It's an oval. Oh, because of the big. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. So we should call it an oval. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
You did. Oh, my goodness. Tomorrow. Yes. Do you want to meet? It makes perfect sense as you describe it. I was just thinking as the bomb hits, here's my target, and I draw a circle around it. But you're right. It's an old. <laughs> But if you've got a thousand aircraft, you're much, much wider than the, the target's going to be. You have, again, an excellent point. And this is part of the divergence of approach that occurred with the British and the Americans. Just tell me. The British, recognizing their bomb sites were a little less accurate, needed to have a broader spread of area that they could hit. And as a result, tended to structure their oncoming, what we call the bomber stream, a bit differently from the Americans. The Americans feeling that they were more precise, and that's why they went to daylight as opposed to night bombing, because the British said, you're going to take terrible losses going up during the day, which we did until we had aircraft that could accompany them to target. We said if we have a bomber stream that's more stacked up than spread out, because of the accuracy, we can drop a heavier load of tonnage on the intended target. There's no point in spreading yourself out because over there is nothing you care about anyway. So it's a very interesting element that you just brought up, and it highlights part of the difference in tactics and the controversies between the British and Americans. Now, the P-38 had a longer range than, than the Thunderbolt, right? So yes. it, it, did it, have, it didn't have the range of the Mustang? or No, the Mustang was the final aircraft that could follow them all the way to target in battle. But it, it, was it that the P-38 being a full engine, it was more costly to build, and, and I guess they were used in a specific theater more. Yes. Um, and there were differences which, you know, in talking to someone who's a pilot, and I've done that because I have a, a friend who does that, the differences in aircraft performance at different altitudes and speeds is extraordinary. I mean, we, we don't tend to understand those dynamics quite as well. But when you start reading uh, histories of air forces and things of that nature, you find that all these little nuances, am I better at high altitude? Am I better at low altitude? What's my turning radius? And things of that nature. You end up saying to yourself, wow, <laughs> you know, these guys aren't just flying an airplane and say there's a target shoot at them. You've got all these other nuances that play into it. And that's part of the reason why it's not just a matter of altitude for accuracy. And when you go to the Pacific theater in particular, the other thing to remember is that many of the things we were bombing were islands. Now, strategic bombing, we tend to think of just hitting the Japanese homeland, and that was a key focus, but you had to get close enough to carry a bomb load that was worth it. So if you have heavy bombers congregating in the Pacific, where are you going to put them so they can hit the homeland? Well, the B-29, the longest range and the heaviest bomb load, we put those initially in China. So if you're flying from New Guinea or from Australia, Japan's out of reach. So what are you going to hit? You're going to hit islands. So in that regard, accuracy was a little less necessary. Now, an interesting sidelight, just for jumping ahead of it, is in 1944, after the Normandy landings, there was an attempt to use heavy bombs to blast a pathway through the German defenses so the Allies could break out of the Normandy bridgehead. The first time they did that, they actually caused an enormous number of U.S. casualties, including killing an American general in the process. And they so tore up the ground that it was like World War I all over again. You couldn't advance. You had no, no way to get through. 
So they learned a valuable lesson and had to adjust their technique, what bombs you're going to drop, how heavily they're weighted. You don't want 500 pounders if a 250 pound will do it. And you can put more 250s on, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. It's yeah. enormously complicated as to how that would work. Okay, let's sit back down for the moment, and I'm going to throw out to you, and some of you are a bit too quiet, including all of you in Zoom land, <laughs> and I don't want you to feel shy about jumping in, but let's talk a minute first about the ethics of strategic bombing. In other words, what constitutes a legitimate target in war such that you would employ a particular weapon which can strike not military targets, that is people in uniform with weapons, but can target those who are at least personally defenseless. Anyone want to weigh in on that? What are the moral restraints, if any, in war? Don't be afraid to speak. Are you attacked or are you the attacker? That changes the- Either the way. And the, Either way. Just change the, the equation. Okay. You're defending your, your homeland, your family, your country from some outside aggression who seems to be ruthless because they attack you. Changes the equation versus if you're attacking someone, you may have, you can set some bounds if you're the attacker. There may not be any bounds or limits if you're being attacked. Okay. And as you saw from the slides on 1939, where Roosevelt calls for confining attacks to military targets, and even Hitler and Churchill agree that this is the case, it still escalates. Not dramatically, instantaneously, but by a series of steps. And remember that the attacks using against Hiroshima and Nagasaki are strategic bombing attacks. Okay. But we're still debating that at, at this time. Well, we debate it for the following reasons, though, and, and bring out why you think we even bother to debate it now. What What is the fundamental issue? But we're still trying to set the bounds. We're never, we weren't comfortable then. We aren't comfortable now. And no matter what anyone's positions are, it's a personal choice and our assessment of the equation. And, and that'll go on forever. Okay, it's, but it's you're a military no, leader. I'm, I'm going to put it to you this way you're a military leader. All right. You have spent the last year and a half or so bombing cities in a homeland, whether it's Germany or Japan, it happened because of the nature of the development of the atomic bomb. But let's assume for the moment Germany had not surrendered, that somehow they had established a relative stalemate in the Eastern and Western fronts. And you now have nuclear weapons. Would you use them? There has to be personally. Well, then, you're the leader of the country. Okay. You're you're the president who ultimately makes that decision. Your military leaders can come to you and say, we can continue sending over bomber streams like we did at Schweinfurt and Ploesti mm -hmm. and have 35% plus casualties. Or you can send over one plane, which they think is nothing more than reconnaissance and they're not going to bother with it, and drop a bomb that contains 20 thousand tons of explosive if what's the what's the reason for that ever been in a street fight uh um, you, know, you get into a street fight someone comes up and just punches you right you react yep now you draw limits probably not you're gonna you're gonna survive someone breaks into your house right <clears throat> and they're you think they're gonna do all the damage to your family your kids mm -hmm. Is there a limit? Probably not. Right. So okay. the issue of proportionality is the second part of what you're you're bringing up. Um, is there a proportion? The <laughs> there you go. So that's <laughs> one of the fundamental that. questions in front of us. The news media likes that, and some some people after it's over would like that. But 
if they're up, I'll pick the easy one because we see it in the news a lot. Someone breaks into the house, it's a couple people, and you got young kids, and, and things have happened in the neighborhood where right. people come in, raped, killed, whatever else they've done. You think I've got it limits? I don't have a limit. Now, I'm think gonna, I'm about do all I have to do to win. Right. Now, think, think about two elements that are in front of us right at the moment. All right. Has the issue of proportionality been brought up in the conflict in Gaza? Mm -hmm. Has anyone been discussing that? Mm -hmm. All right. How about proportionality in Ukraine? Not as much. Why is that? In other words, what draws the distinction between what we consider a proportion? Of, what does that even mean? Does that mean that if the Germans killed only 40,000 Brits, that we should only kill 40,000 Germans? You saw how many we killed. We killed 2 million. We've seen that when they start to plan wars and that shuck and awe, whatever it was. Right. It, it's a personality thing. So you got some people that say, if you come in, I'm just going to beat the crap out of you so badly, no one else will ever do it again. Right. So, so after it's over or while this is going on, proportionality is a nice mm -hmm. academic argument. But I, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are just, it's purely human nature between one person or another or another. And it's situational. I don't personally think you can set some sort of rule on that. Now, every, all of us have a different view on this. Right. And they're all legitimate. But who's in charge sets the rules. Well, aren't we creating a re-examining the morality with every change in technology? So a million Russians died in, in St. Petersburg in Leningrad during the siege. And right. siege has been a tool of war for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, starvation is an issue in Gaza. So the fact that we have new technologies make us examine these questions, but we're still killing civilians. Mm -hmm. And whether you do it by a traditional method like siege, or whether you do it with a, a, a laser guided bomb, it, it's still killing civilians. Yeah. This phrase resonates with me in terms of that. Now, just for a second, is that it doesn't matter if the pitcher hits the rock or the rock hits the pitcher, the effect on the pitcher is the same. Yes. Yeah, to expand on that point too, um, I, the change in technology, why was Hiroshima so bad, but Tokyo's hardly mentioned? And in terms of the strategic goal, what would the difference be between the 20 kiloton bomb and I don't know, or 1,000 or what would be 10,000 fully loaded B-29s dropping TNT on it. It would have, you know, the uh, force of the attack would be the same, but, you know, what's so horrible is that the advance in technology that was used to implement it and that 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 changes the whole proportionality uh, equation. You know, you you went from starvation in a siege to fire bombs, mm -hmm. to nuclear bombs, right? And but it's still the same strategic goal. We're going to come to that, Robert. I would suggest that once the two words unconditional surrender have been uttered that the whole notion of proportionality has fundamentally changed. I think that's an important part. Now, here's the other part that resonates with me, at least in terms of looking at this. And in a minute, I'm going to shift and we'll just go to the Battle of the Atlantic. Did we actually invade Japan? No. Yeah. No. Did we invade Germany? Oh, yeah. Yes. Why did Japan surrender? Douay's theory was that air power alone can destroy a nation. 
And that was demonstrated forcefully, not just through the firebombing of Tokyo and other cities to the point where there were few targets left, which is why Hiroma, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were hit. Well, we would have invaded Japan had it not been for the bomb. Right. So Douai was basically right in the sense yeah. that strategic bombing could end a war, could force your enemy to surrender. That didn't happen with Germany in spite of the enormous destruction by conventional bombs. But this new destructive power with nuclear weapons was in effect a morale game changer. Very different mm -hmm. from the morale that occurs watching a bomber stream come over and a whole bunch of bombs being unloaded. Yes. But it affected the morale of the leadership. Yes. Did not, you know, the, the populace had no say in it. Right, exactly, which is another part of where we come. Yes. I want to muddy up your other question. Okay. <laughs> Do you think you're going to win? That is the fundamental. And are your, and we've talked about this at different times through this, but the fundamental question is why do you go to war in the first place? What do you expect to gain if you win? And when you start to lose, what do you expect to hold on to? And that's where a lot of the dynamics are in play right this moment, right with us today. And I just read an article about the increased concerns over China's aggressiveness because their economy is struggling. And what better way to divert domestic unrest is to engage with a foreign enemy. So there are a number of different issues involved. Now, uh, just before you do that, I'll, I'll get you. Uh, is that the Battle of the Atlantic, again, is a very strategic act because not military targets are being hit, at least in the usual sense of the word. Remember, this is unrestricted submarine warfare, mm. which means the target matters, not who's in it, mm. not who's manning it. Okay, yes, Greg. Ukraine, Russians are trying to terror bomb the populace and break civilian morale. Mm -hmm. Ukraine is not worried about breaking populace of Russia and its morale because they don't have any say. So Ukraine is going after military targets, mm -hmm. bridges, ships in the Black Sea, uh, supply dumps behind the Russian lines. Right. That's that's the only thing that they have available to them to try and. Right. Do what they're trying to do. And again, if, if any of you is interested, the military summary channel on YouTube is well worth watching at least once or twice to get a different view of what's going on, what the nature of the fighting is like, losses and gains and so on. Let me go on and finish up this lecture with this, the Battle of the Atlantic. As I've talked about before in earlier lectures, the construct here was very strategic. That is that the Germans wished to reduce any potential supplies reaching England, and in doing so conducted what was called unrestricted submarine warfare, much as they had done in World War I, and had come near to great success in World War I, as well as up until the middle of almost 1943 where the losses inflicted on shipping were enormous. As this happened, and don't worry about the slides, but I just want you to look for a minute at two things. The red lines indicate where the aircraft could cover. As you got into late 43 or middle of 43 into 44, and the reasons to show this have to do with the importance of air cover which allowed convoys to be told if German submarines were being found or discovered. The aircraft did not at that particular time do much to attack German submarines. That happened a bit later where you can see off the coast of England and in the Bay of Biscay, 
on just north of Spain, on the western coast of France, and so on, where aircraft became more predominant in actually attacking the submarines in transit back and forth. But in the middle portions of the Atlantic, air coverage was very deficient for many areas. And you'll see the change in the bulge between the left portion of this slide and the right portion of this slide, particularly in the area off the coast of Spain. And this has to do with because we now had North Africa, okay? Just as an example. This shows even later, but here are the other important elements that became critical. The development of the shipping to support the convoys, not just replacement of transports, but the enormous growth in the destroyer escorts that were used to help protect the convoys. And they could only really, because of their relatively short range, they could only stray a short distance from the convoy. They had to stay fairly close in. They couldn't go off further until we developed things like the uh, small escort carriers, the CVEs, which had increased range, could refuel their accompanying destroyers and use their aircraft to hunt for German submarines. Now, the problems that were apparent to us was that because we had intercepted and began to understand exactly the radio transmissions from uh, Donetsk out to his submarines, we could begin to identify where they were. But you still had to find them, right? And a submarine, in spite of its size, is not a big vehicle, right? And it has a low profile on the water. And if there's any trouble with the water itself, waves, if you have cloud cover, things of this sort, it could be even harder to find. So other technologies had to develop. But one of the key things that I talked about in a previous lecture was how merchant ship construction grew phenomenally through the Liberty ships in particular and began to exceed losses. But you still had to have crews. You had to have trained people to manage. You had to have the port systems that could allow these large numbers of ships to be loaded, organized, and sent across. So the logistical complications here are immense. This just shows, again, it's a lousy slide in one sense. <laughs> But it just shows that in terms of 1943, if you look down at the very bottom where it says year total, 2,400,000 tons of shipping go down at the cost of 245 submarines. So just do a quick division and you'll see what that means. The point is that submarine losses vary depending upon the season of the year. And you can see how those numbers change according to the season, but more particularly how different targets were hit and the emphasis the Germans were still placing in 43 and into 44 on what we'll call a strategic initiative. Okay, all right. How did the US and Britain respond? We know about the convoy system. We know that there were great arguments initially about how this was to happen. And there was what was called the second happy time off the coast of the United States where ships were not in convoy and the German submarines just came over and devastated uh, the individual ships, some of them being sunk within sight of shore. And indeed, so deficient was the United States response initially that many cities were still lit up and backlit mm -hmm. the ships that are moving across the coastline. You tend to think to yourself, didn't you learn anything from World War I? What's the matter with you folks? But there were actually, excuse me, <laughs> there were actually reasons for it. And that had to do with the speed of the transports. It was thought initially, that maybe single transports that were faster than others now don't have to go in concert with the slowest ship. They can move ahead at their own speed and maybe they can outrun or uh, avoid a submarine. Submarine on the surface, however, was fairly fast. And much of the damage done in 42 
was done with submarines on the surface, engaging the defenders with gunfire. It wasn't until the convoy system really came into play that we began to look at submarines going underwater and targeting that way. The United States finally began to grasp the nettle of protecting our transports with the creation of what's called the 10th Fleet. Now, Admiral King, who had already two posts, senior posts, now had this as his third, but eventually he realized he needed an expert to run it. So he passed that off to, I think it was Ingersoll, uh, to run that. And I may have the name wrong. The other part was now they had to coordinate better with the British. And in order to do that, rather than just mixing ships together of different nations, which were trained under different circumstances and had somewhat different doctrines, the idea was that United States escorts would be a consolidated group and they would at most pass off to a British consolidated group uh, of escort vehicles at the Central Atlantic meeting point where they would come together with appropriate ranges. It sounds like a no brainer, but you have to remember that at the beginning of the war, things were not organized and the United States didn't get into this conflict until 41, and that was only in December. And then we only really participated well into 42 because we hadn't geared up to any of the construction that was necessary. It was also determined that therefore there would not be one operational doctrine. Now, as US influence increased and we had more and more bombers placed in England, which could now be used also for over the Atlantic coverage, that operational doctrine still remained the purview of the proper command structure. So the US doctrines were somewhat different from the British. We learned from each other. But nonetheless, we still trained and executed our missions somewhat differently. Is that a disadvantage? Maybe. But remember, the aircraft are designed differently as well, as I showed you in the earlier slide. So if your aircraft is designed in a particular way, why do you have that when you could look at this other aircraft and say, why don't we just all make the same and make logistics a lot easier? So there's just one need for replacement parts, not four or five or 10. Losses still were severe throughout the war. There's a misunderstanding that in spite of the losses German submarines suffered during the war, and it became really devastating for them, that the fall off, the real fall off in losses did not occur until into 45. In 44, the losses were still severe. So we say, oh, it went down by 50% in 45 compared to 44. Yeah, but the losses were still big. Total wartime loss, just amazing. Production though, look at the production. Unbelievable. I, the United States basically created a transport of a merchant fleet that was larger than the combined fleets of almost every country put together prior to World War II. That's how much had been accomplished in just our five years, four years of conflict. It's really just four. <clears throat> what kind of developments occurred? As with everything, once your opponent does something, you try to find a way to deflect or respond. How do you do that? And what kinds of issues are you going to address? Well, one of the key issues for the allies was the development of what's called huff duff, uh, if you like pronunciations of that sort. And this was a technology that had been known relatively speaking, even well before the war, even in the 20s, radio detection had been understood. And it, but it might take a minute or two to be able to locate the source of the radio signal. Huff Duff used a different relationship of antennae in order to establish the location literally within seconds. Now, it's easy to argue that by the time you've detected where a submarine is, 
and you've transmitted that information to some form of attacker, whether it's an airplane or a ship, and that is able to get on site, things have changed markedly. But the point was, at least you could get them in the area and you could try to detect where they were going to be. Now, the other part that changed dramatically was we began to put radar in aircraft. Detection radar, and that's this 10 centimeter. This has to do with some of the physics that Robert knows better than I. But the point is that wavelength has a great deal to do with detection and accuracy and things of that sort. And Towards the end of the war, they could detect uh, a periscope. There you go. All right. Mm -hmm. So the point being that an aircraft flying along at, you know, 150, 200 miles an hour cruising speed out there looking for a target is using its radar to try to pick up something that says, oh, go look here. This is where you can get it. In addition, I had not realized, despite all the reading I'd done, that we were using sono buoys. Yeah. So an aircraft could get into an area where they were, they were told there might be a submarine in this area, and they could drop a buoy into the water, which would ping out, and they could detect the echo and say, oh, there's something over here. Go look there. And even a submerged submarine could be detected that way. From an airplane. From an airplane. So we use those now. In fact, through the um, UK, Iceland, and Greenland gap, as it was called, we placed, during the Cold War, thousands of sono buoys on the floor of the ocean in order to detect Russian submarines that would come through. And these were more long lasting sonar buoys, of course. And they would tell you, oh, there's somebody coming through over here, go look for them. And helicopters now in anti-submarine warfare use sonar buoys repeatedly, and even the Poseidon and some of the other advanced anti-submarine aircraft use sonar buoys to, there must be a hell of a litter down at the <laughs> bottom of the ocean. <laughs> But the other part down at the very bottom is that we had developed, as did the Germans and the Japanese, developed magnetic anomaly detection. I thought this was only very recent. Because of the metal, you could look for deflections in the magnetic actions, I'm not sure the right word, the magnetic fields that existed. And by detecting that, you could say there's something down here, which is metallic, or at least generating its own magnetic field. And we developed acoustic torpedoes. It was called FIDO. And when you got where you could find a submarine in an airplane, you drop this acoustic torpedo, and it searches for the enemy and tracks it down. And it was remarkably accurate, provided the submarine was not at great depth. Depth charges. We've all seen the images of what looks like a great big round barrel being dropped off the end of a destroyer and sinking down. And if you watch submarine movies, you'll see them come down and suddenly explode. It takes a while, time is everything, for those to sink. If you develop and you have an idea from your own sonar and so on, a rough idea of the depth at which that submarine is, the faster you're depth charge gets down there, the less chance it has to get away. So if it has to go down 150 feet, that's different than going 300. And the time difference can play a role in how accurate it is. These are other things that began to happen. And most importantly, through the 10th fleet, we developed what is called an anti-submarine university. Previous to the war, People who were assigned to the submarine service didn't want to stay there, and they needed to move on to the surface fleet in order to get the right command structure so they could move up the ladder. King decided, after painful lessons, I need specialists who are going to remain in place and spend their careers working on any submarine warfare. So this was, again, part of the issue related to it. 
there were different doctrines in place between the Japanese and the Americans in the Pacific conflict. And I highlight this because we have heard, I think I've discussed it previous sections, the so-called long lance torpedo, which was used by Japanese surface craft that was very fast and had very long range. We never came close to being able to match that performance. There was a similar, slightly smaller torpedo that the Japanese submarines used, but it was equally effective and destructive. And the warheads on both of those was greater than the warheads in American torpedoes, even at the end of the war. They were that superior. However, the Japanese doctrine was to target warships. Now they had great success at different times. I'll show you a slide in just a moment about that. But it diverted them from what was the traditional naval effect of commerce raiding, which is what we emphasized. By going after warships, they tended to ignore the more vulnerable transports. Now, admittedly, the transports were in convoys and they were well protected for the most part by escorts. The Japanese, however, took a long time to get to even small convoys, never devoted enough attention to destroyer escorts to help protect those convoys and often were still sailing alone and became ripe targets for American submariners. Japanese technology was remarkably good in a lot of different ways, but they ended up primarily stuck there. Whereas the Americans in response to what was happening in the Atlantic began to move their technology broadly into the Pacific. So when you have airborne radar in the Atlantic, well, of course you're gonna use it in the Pacific. And that's gonna help you hunt Japanese submarines. But the number of Japanese submarines was never as much a threat as it was in Germany. And that is taking into account the vast expanse of the Pacific. Our intelligence services were remarkably good as well. But notice the, the last line, because of the distances and time on station, that is a patrol in the Pacific being so much greater distance and time than was true in the Atlantic, American submarines and Japanese submarines were much larger than German submarines. Double the size for Americans and almost triple the size for Japanese. That's how well-designed they were and how creative they were. This particular submarine of this type, the B-1, was actually the I-19 that had probably the most significant single torpedo attack of the entire war by any Navy, where they sank the Wasp, and I think they sank two other uh, ships with one spread of torpedoes <laughs> and damaged another. One spread. That's how good they were. The reason I mention this is the following. If you look at the displacement and you compare that to the German submarines, put it on surface, the German submarines ran about 750 tons. That's an enormous difference. Notice how fast this submarine is. That is booking. Look at the range. Okay. Notice there's an airplane. Now it wasn't on all of them by any means, but the point was for the Japanese to say, we don't have a lot of submarines, so we need to use them very efficiently. If I put a float plane on a submarine and it launches, it can circle an area that is much greater than I can see and if I detect an appropriate target, it'll direct me to where I needs to go. It may come back and land and I can bring it back on board the submarine. But because of my speed, I can catch most anything because ships did not operate at their maximum speeds. But if you're looking to go 
engage a target, you'll speed up to get there. And then you can slow down when you're done with your patrol and you're headed home. So again, very, very impressive technology. Whereas the Americans, you'll see here, displacement 2,400 tons. Again, Germans around 750. Fast, not quite as fast as the Japanese. The range, not quite as great. But as we moved our bases further and further towards the Japanese homeland, then we could route our submarines either to Australia if they needed major effects or to any of the bases to which we were providing supplies, change crews, and so on. We could do all that. Notice the speed submerged uh, is the 48 hours. That is that when you're operating on batteries alone. And this was important because if you could only stay submerged for eight or 10 hours, and you've got a destroyer up there that kind of knows you're going to come up, then his range of staying within your possible compass, and this technology was known, and you can say, well, I can expect that he'll be roughly in this area, and I can look for him and find him. But if you're 48 hours worth, who, where the hell is he? Yes. Is that 48 hours for the whole cruise, or is that every time he surfaces, recharge? You had to recharge. Then he gets another 48. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Almost like charging your electric vehicle, yeah. but it took a while, as it does with your electric vehicle. Sorry about that. I know I probably made some people angry. <laughs> American torpedoes, notoriously, in the beginning of the war, were very deficient. A lot of duds, a lot of misses, ran too deep. It took a long time to convince the Bureau of Ordnance that they were defective. Uh, but eventually we got a much more effective torpedo. Sometimes it would take two strikes to sink a ship. Sometimes it would take more. The Japanese torpedoes were much more powerful. Generally, if you got hit once, you were in big trouble, though a warship could sustain more damage. So by diverting their actions against warships, they had to expend more ammunition to try to get a sink, whereas against a merchant ship, you could do a lot of damage. And if you're carrying, as you'll see here, 24 torpedoes as opposed to 17, then you can stay out longer and you can sink more stuff. A lot of your time was spent just looking. The deck gun that you see here was a preliminary deck gun. Towards the end of the war, they got up to five inch, which is a huge gun when you think about it, with great range and great striking power. And some of them actually mounted two. This gives you an idea of the effectiveness, the losses, 52 submarines for the Americans. The Japanese submarine force was basically annihilated by the end of the war. <clears throat> There's practically none left. What they were using at that point were the Catons, which were basically sort of like one-man torpedoes. All right, you get in a torpedo with a little cockpit and you run yourself into a ship, like a kamikaze, but at the water. Japanese merchant losses <clears throat> just gives you an idea of their production, half of what their losses were. We targeted especially tankers because we knew that by attacking tankers, Japan had no fuel resources worth noting in its homeland. They had to get their fuel from elsewhere. So once they occupied the Southwest Pacific regions where the oil was, they had to get it back to the homeland. And we made a very deliberate decision to attack tankers as the prime targets, but we devastated the merchant fleets. Some people feel that that would have ended the war in and of itself. Again, a sort of strategic approach to things. So to summarize, there are a couple of quick things in this last minute. First, as usual, I want to thank you for participating, and especially those of you who bother at Zoomland to sign in. To me, this is a 
truly a great honor and I really appreciate it deeply. The second part is that the nature of war, the conduct of war, the rules of war tie in very carefully to what you hope to accomplish, what you're willing to pay to get there, what you want your enemy to do in response to your actions so that he'll surrender to you, whatever that means politically, and that these questions are relevant to us today, literally to this moment, so that whenever you're reading something or running across somebody's missive of what are this and that uh, may happen or is happening, mm -hmm. maybe you can bring a little deeper insight into it than before. And I'm gonna add to this one little bit of an article I read literally this morning. Uh, China's particular moves that it's been taking uh, recently are such that there's an enormous danger involved. And this danger is one which cannot be ignored by our leaders. I hope and I believe to some extent they're beginning to pay attention to it. But if you run across things on where China is headed under Xi and the economic difficulties they're facing and the attitude, at least according to this article, that she is manifesting about building his military up to be able to confront us in particular uh, if he wishes to make more aggressive moves is one that's analogous to what was leading up to World War II. Certain levels of aggressiveness, of behavior, of military development, of distraction by other conflicts elsewhere that divert your attention from dealing with what is the next potential real threat is something that I think we all can take away from these lectures and help us understand what we expect of our leaders. Then, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> From out here in Zoom land, I got to tell you, this has been one superior presentation, and I thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I, I admit I love flattery. <laughs> bravo, bravo. I think so, too. Oh, thanks. When is the next session, and what will be its focus? I'm ready to sign up. <laughs> uh, I've been asked to present in the fall. So I think it'll be in the time frame of September, October. And my hope is to spend an inordinate amount of detail in 1945. So you'll invite me back in the spring of 2025. And that'll be just uh, the proper time frame to do 1945 at the end of World War II. Think of it as an anniversary day, oh, right? Thank you. And then from I'm that time, up. it's getting old. <laughs> Are we all? Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Have you ever thought of doing the Napoleonic Wars? Yeah, that's what I thought. I haven't, actually, uh, only because I find that I was focusing forward. I think the Napoleonic Wars are absolutely fascinating. But 